Today, we're going to talk about 12 mistakes first time home buyers regret the most. Did you know that almost two thirds uh, or 63% of all millennial homeowners regret their first home purchase? I mean, that's, that's huge. That's, that's out, that's out of this world. 63%. And here we go clicking on the millennials again, but yeah, <laughs> that's an astounding number. So, I mean, let's let's see if we can help out the next wave of millennials or the next wave of home buyers and sort of pick apart what are the 12 most common uh, mistakes uh, that are the cause of these regrets, and maybe we can help you avoid them, yeah? Absolutely. Great idea. Get us started, Janice. All right. So, number one, they didn't set a budget. So, wh- why is this like a common regret? Maybe they didn't think that it was a good investment, the mortgage payment is too high, or... Why does it happen is that they thought maybe the house was too expensive. I mean, it really breaks down to if you don't have a budget and you don't sit down and know what you can pay a month, it's going to lead to problems. Yeah. So like, look, what you want to avoid is that feeling after, after you purchase that you overpaid or that this is just too much of a burden. Those are sort of like the, the regretful feelings you have after the fact, Mr. You know, two-thirds of millennials. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. so, but the reason these things happen is because you didn't really, m- maybe, you know, perhaps you didn't, um, they didn't set a proper budget. You didn't realize what is and isn't too expensive, right? Right, uh, right. So and, how, how do we go about avoiding this, avoiding this, Janice? Well, first of all, what you talk about, you know, a budget. You could simply go online to a mortgage calculator and say, oh, I could afford that. Right. But Really, those aren't really realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, your financial advisor can tell you exactly what you're supposed to be paying and what your budget is. But if you look online, I mean, geez, I could go online and say, oh, look at that, you know, $500,000 house for, you know, two grand a month. Oh, well, maybe. Um, But you're not calculating everything into it. You got taxes, escrow, upkeep. I mean, there's a lot more to it. But, and I think this we're meeting with a good financial advisor originally is a good solid plan. You also need to make sure that. Even if you can technically afford something, you have to make sure that's something that you're comfortable paying. So Correct. What I mean by that is, okay, so a a mortgage, com- a, ba- a lender, a bank may be willing to give you a mortgage at let's like using your numbers, two thousand dollars per month, right? Um, and even take assuming you can still af- you can afford all the other th- costs that you mentioned, the upkeep and the other um, home ownership costs. The question isn't whether or not you can. The question is whether or not this is something that you want to do. Right. So even if you can technically eke by, is, that, is it ek or eke? Eke by? Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> at, squeeze by. With squeeze, <laughs> exactly. Squeeze by at those numbers. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe you don't want to be living right up to the to the limit. So because right. you, you got to remember the incentives here. The banks make more money the more they lend to you because that means you're paying them more interest and you're a bigger customer. They have every incentive to push you right up to the limit, right? Correct. Without them feeling risk of your defaulting. That's not the same as what your incentives are. Your incentive is not necessarily to buy the hugest house you can possibly afford, but rather the best house for your situation, which might mean having more financial buffer, yeah? Right, because you're going to be more comfortable. You're not going to be up to that max budget where you can't go to Starbucks if you wanted to because you're going to be able to make your mortgage payment at the end of the month. Right. That's not comfortable living if you enjoy eating, you oh. know, other things. Or people. cutting out family vacations or whatever. Oh, right, right. You know? Yeah. So, cool. it, it, you know, you, you've mentioned before, try the budget out for a few months. Yeah. So if they're telling you to 2000 you know, you factor in what you need to. Play it out. Pretend, if you will, for those yep. few months that you have to spend that amount of money. See how it feels. Cool. M- move us along to number two, Janice. So you didn't get pre-approved. Common regrets. You didn't get the best mortgage rate. You didn't get the right house. These are the regrets after the fact. Um, why this happens, it, they start start house hunting before mortgage yeah. shopping. Now, there's two sides to this. One is that's just it's bad. Now I was guilty of it. The first house, I was so Mm. excited. You know, you go, you start going to open houses and you're like, yeah, I want this house. And they look at you and say, how are you going to pay for it? Um, (laughs) didn't think of that yet, but you know, the education really wasn't there back then. Um, but then you think of the flip side of that. Have you ever prepared your house for someone to walk through like a walkthrough or an open house? Right. I have with lots of children and it's very frustrating when you, you have this whole uh, you prep and you get out of the house, you take the dogs, you take the cats and you have someone come through and they're like, 
oh, we love it, we love it. Oh, but we don't have any financing. Right. <laughs> it's like it's very frustrating. But talk about like, you know, why is it important aside look, from Yeah, if you don't get your pre approval, look, so if you're if you're looking to buy a house and you you found you fall in love with the the right house or what you think is the right house, but you don't have your ducks in a row, you're not ready to move on it, you're gonna lose to somebody who is yeah. ready. Somebody else who is ready to close is gonna come in with a equal or better offer, but they're gonna be a better a more attractive candidate to the seller because they are ready. They're more prepared. And, you know, even if you can get your stuff together, it just shows that you weren't really serious. You know, maybe, maybe there will be other problems with you later. Um, It just, it's like someone who didn't come in with their homework. That's, that's who you are now. You're the kid who didn't do his homework. (laughs) (laughs) You're that kid who has to sit out for recess and made the teacher mad. But well, it's very true. That's one of the very first steps, but now I think it's a little easier. That's they're edu You're being educated. A lot of people, um, are getting that information of do your homework first before you go. Right on. Okay. Yeah, third, then th- you won't lose out on that. So uh, the third one, yep. you make a tiny down payment. <laughs> so some regrets they're having is maybe their mortgage payment is too high. You know, you don't put enough down, the mortgage payment goes up. I mean, that's yep. pretty simple math. Yep. Um, and again, goes back to they didn't think it was a good investment. Um, so talk to us about down payments. I know there's a 20%, but get a, that does change the long run of what you pay per month and the um, out, the final of the loan. Yeah, bottom line is um, you should be putting down as much po- down payment as you can comfortably do uh, right around the 20. I mean, the, re- the, the rule of thumb is 20%. And it's a rule of thumb for a reason because it's a good balance between um, putting down enough so that your mortgage repayment amount is not crushing, but it's also not putting down too much so that you're getting the full benefits of leverage of the mortgage, right? Because right. that's the whole point of the mortgage system. You're, you're buying more than you can actually afford on your own. But you, you don't, you don't want to be uh, in a position where you're, you're your mortgage repayment or, or the interest thereon is just ridiculous. So just right. the rule of thumb is there for a reason. 20%, use that as a reasonable target. And, and like we said before, uh, I, I keep beating this drum, but it's important. Try living your test budget. Um, so if you think you want to buy a house, you're, let's say your, your down payment savings is $50,000 and you think, oh, I'll, I'll just buy a house with a, five da- a 5% down payment, which would mean a much higher mortgage um, payment. See what that feels like. Just pretend you're living on that budget for a few weeks or, or, or months, actually. And um, I, I don't want to just keep keep uh, <laughs> writing that point. No, but so, it's true. Yeah, it's yeah. it's very true. And and in the, on the same side of that, test it out beforehand. Yep. You know, while you're testing out and you have to, you know, pretend you're using this money, yep. put it, start putting it away towards that down payment. Sure. You know, if you have to spend a couple extra month, months, you know, saving up a little bit more and a little bit more yep. to for in the long run, your mortgage to be lower, it's, it's a no brainer. I mean, really, if you think about it, Here, Jay, I'm going I'm, I'm to take on number four and, and move Go us on. along a little quickly just to uh, pick up the pace a little bit. Absolutely. So mistake number four is uh, ignoring assistant government assistant programs. And again, you, you might end up thinking you, you paid a little too much or you didn't get the best rates. And maybe you skipped out on some some programs that you did, you could have really taken advantage of. I mean, I know these don't apply to everyone, but uh, VA, uh, Veterans Affairs, USDA, I, I don't, I'm sure you might be wondering why does the Department of Agriculture have programs? They do. And um, uh, FHA, they all have loan pr- programs that can either uh, allow you to do a much lower down payment or can hook you up with a mortgage rate that's much lower than you would otherwise qualify for. So at the very least, look into it. I mean, with, with Google and just, you can whip out your phone and just check yeah. if you qualify in just like 10 minutes. Just spend two minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Just check. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Moving on to number five. So this part, this is the one that drives me nuts. Uh, did you know, Janice, that 47% of home buyers did not compare lenders, meaning almost half of home buyers just go with the first wow. rate they get? I may be guilty with that one, especially originally, <laughs> because they don't tell you, you know, when you're when you're going through the process and and you're, you're with a realtor and like, oh, we got a yeah. lender, and you know, you don't really think, wait, maybe I should shop around. Yeah, I mean, because we, again, we're learning. This okay, is, Janice, what's the last like toy you bought for your kids? Or okay, it's good. Well, electronics, everything's right. Electronics. And how much time right. did you spend researching that and comparing where you should buy it from and looking at reviews? And an embarrassing amount, yes. right? But you didn't do that, <laughs> and I'm not. I don't mean to pick on you because this is everyone. No, but but people right. don't do that for their biggest financial decision in their life. Correct. But when they're buying a toaster, they go nuts. <laughs> <laughs> they want the reviews. I yeah. want to know all the recalls. Yeah. No, you are right. Yeah. So I mean, I don't mean to you know make anyone <laughs> feel bad, but just, okay. Like bottom line, get at least three different rate quote, quotes. Just the way you would check prices on at least. 
if you're traveling, right? You go to Travelocity, you go to yes. Kayak, you go to the, 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 the airline itself, you check, right? You just check. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I do the same thing you know, for a $100 hotel mm-hmm. room. Why would I not do that for, you're right, yeah. And don't go with just one lender giving you three quotes or one broker giving you three quotes. Shop around, right? Uh, yeah. and, and lastly, make sure you're asking questions until you feel like you understand. Meaning, don't, if someone is telling you that a 10 1 arm with a balloon interest rate is the best possible, you know, payment system for you and you don't quite understand, but it sounds good. Yeah. Oh, you try to understand. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like, what? A balloon where? Where are we? Like, hot air balloon or what? Yeah. All right. So, moving on, the, num- the sixth mistake uh, that you can, you should try to avoid so that you don't regret like two thirds of uh, millennials <laughs> buying a home. Yeah. Um, make sure you, 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 you take care of your credit. So credit is closely tied to maybe paying, ending up with too high a mortgage payment or maybe not getting the best possible mortgage rate. You got to check your credit. I mean, it's so easy now. There's free or annual credit report.com, free credit yeah. check. Doc, there's so many websites. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a couple of clicks. You're in, you get your report yep. um, and you're, you're allowed to get it once a year for free. Um, and, and just you look at it because there's stuff you forget about, like the medical bill that you yeah. got and you set aside and you're like, oh, oops. And so, yeah, we've had mistakes on our credit reports before. Something like a missed, uh, an alleged missed payment on a Macy's card or something. And right, if right. it's a mistake, fix it and your score will jump. And it, that yep, can re- exactly. result in thou- tens of thousands in savings over the course of your mortgage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you've talked about this in your book. Yeah. On the flip side of that is don't start making big purchases before you're about to buy a home. It's not a good time to go change your banks, buy a car, do this, open that. You know, yeah. kind of leave it status quo. Um, again, you talk about that right in your book. Yep. Thanks for mentioning it. How to buy your perfect first home available on Amazon. Yeah, you, you don't want to just check your credit and fix the small mistakes. You want to make sure that you keep it the way it is if it's good. You don't want to change right. jobs or, you know, like, like as you just mentioned, no big purchases. Just keep things status quo once you get it all sorted out. Exactly. Okay, number seven mistake. Don't work with the wrong realtor. And working with the wrong realtor will just, you might end up with a, a less than ideal location, the non-perfect home, or you might you might pay too much. Right. Um, when we say the wrong realtor, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that there's any like used car salesman, you know, cliched <laughs> gross guys out there, but there are situations where the incentives are not lined up in your favor. And the most common example is when you sign up to have the seller's agent double up as your agent as well, right? Yeah, so, that just seems like that won't be in your best interest in the long run if there's a problem. Right, exactly. So what I'm talking about is, uh, let's say the seller hires an agent and they list the house and they're holding open houses and you you walk into the open house and you're interested, but you're not represented at that time. And they say, hey, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to represent you as well. And you think, hey, this person's super nice and very pleasant, why not? Um, yeah, when... At, you know, if any conflict, I mean, although technically the words exist in the law that the person owes a fiduciary duty to both of you and, and blah, 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 you had lip service. The bottom line is, right. <laughs> you know, if the deal falls apart, sh- that broker, realtor is still going to be working with the seller to sell that house. You know, that, somebody that's else. where the money Correct. is, selling the house. <laughs> so right. where do you think the loyalties lie? <laughs> right. It comes down to dollars and cents. I mean, yeah. that is the reality of it. Yeah. Uh, not to say that it's impossible and there might be situations where it does make sense, but at least be aware of these potential conflicts of interest. Yes. All right. Again, doing your homework. Just yeah. do your homework. Very good. Number eight mistake. Uh, you didn't quite understand how home values worked. I mean, that's that seems common sense. Don't you want right. to know if you paid too much or too little? Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So one problem is... Um, you know, you might regret your home purchase because you feel like it didn't, it hasn't increased enough in value since you, since you bought it. Right. So, so you can't expect in one week that your value increases. I mean, that'd be really nice, but it may not, not only may it not increase, it may stay the same and it might go down a little bit. I mean, the markets fluctuate. That's life. So do yourself a favor. Don't, you know, look at the online values of your house for at least one or two years after you buy. Because what's the point? It's not like you're going to sell, right? I mean, right. Or you shouldn't, but uh, no, you give it a few years. And you've you've talked about this before as well. The, the valuations that you find online when you quick type in your address, those aren't necessarily even remotely accurate. Yep. Um, 
So wait, okay, if you really want to look in a few years from now, look at the houses around you that have just sold for actual dollars. Yes. That will give you a much better indication of what your house will would be worth mm -hmm. than going online and typing it in because you know you have five different websites, you get five different answers. Well, this is actually really that's a really important tip for when you're in the process of buying. Because don't get fooled into thinking when you're trying to figure out what is the right price for this house that I'm interested in buying. Don't get fooled into thinking that the asking prices for the neighboring houses is what you should be measuring against. Correct. That's just the hopes and dreams of the people who are selling now. That's not what people are willing to pay. You know. Correct. So yep. you need you need to look at what has actually closed and actually sold because that represents what people have actually you know, reached into their wallet <laughs> the and paid real. for. Yep. Price. Yep. Correct. Correct. All right. Number nine. Can you take the take us take us home, Janice? So they fell in love yeah. with the house. I mean, that happens. You go to the open house and you're like, oh, it's so wonderful. But the common regrets are you pay too much. I mean, or you don't think it's a good investment. Same problems as before. You love the place. Would you pay a little too much to get somewhere that you you, you love? Um, because you're not compromising on what's really important. Yeah. You know, you're, you're focused on the house, maybe not the whole neighborhood mm -hmm. that you realize after the fact of, oh, this does not fit. Um, mm -hmm. it, again, do your homework. You may love the house and the open concept when you walk in and it's wonderful, but you hate the neighborhood. Spend a couple minutes looking into this and it's going to really help these regrets in the long run. So I can think of so many funny and inappropriate analogies <laughs> to like man-woman relationships, you know, yep. fall, falling along with the wrong things that are not long-term important to you. But well, let's just leave it at that. You did a good job explaining. Okay. That. <laughs> yeah, because I, I could go on. A, I could go on a tangent um, on that one too. So yeah. that, that happens. Um, no, but it's true. I mean, just do your homework, look around, see, you know, make sure it's what you want in the long run, and it's not going to stretch your budget. You know, going for that white picket fence if yeah. what's outside of the white picket fence isn't going to work for you. Yeah. Um, number ten, didn't negotiate enough. So again, common regrets still back to the same thing. Of you think you paid too much, or you don't think it's a good investment. That's regrets after the fact of. You know what? Everyone's, you just said everyone's prices they were asking were pretty high. So you asked pretty high, but you didn't look at the real bottom line of what everyone was actually paying for it. So this one is tough because I, I understand most people don't enjoy negotiating. It's, it's uncomfortable. People want to be liked and yeah, negotiation is necessarily <laughs> being disagreeable and fighting right. for your terms. But you know what? Even if it's uncomfortable, in this case, it's totally worth it. It's important. And let me let me tell you something. I think this is going to help any home buyer out there who who subconsciously, even if you don't quite you know feel it on the surface, you you know that you don't you're not negotiating because you just want to feel liked. Nobody cares <laughs> if you fight for your points and your your issues and your you know every dollar or you know, uh, element of the deal, and then you're able to shake hands and do and and um, go into contract and consummate the deal. Nobody will remember that, oh, this guy, he made a big deal over the, um, I don't know, cutting down the tree in the lawn. I don't know what the issues might right. be. Once it's done, it's done. No one it's will remember. No. So unless you're just this total, total out there whack job fighting for weird stuff, you know, as, I mean, and I guess that's kind of where, where you need to figure out where the line is. But as long as you're fighting for, you know, purchase price, move-in date, things that are quite normal, don't feel self-conscious about it. Get what you need. Get what's right for right. you and your family. Right, right. Yeah. And, and your realtor will hopefully steer you in the correct direction of, yeah. you know, what to do, like how, where to stand firm on different points of your, your negotiating mm -hmm. and uh, it's, you know, never skip your inspection or, yep. you know, there's just different things that, they're, that are going to come up. And if you have the right realtor, they're going to take you in that correct direction. So I have one point here before you move on, Janice, that I don't want to yes. go into too deep, but we, we will do a whole nother episode on this about how to get a realtor rebate. And what that oh, means is... In, a in any deal, uh, the realtors on both sides are, are earning about 6% of the total value of the house, of the, of the purchase, of the deal. So in using Manhattan as an example, average price is about a million dollars. There's $60,000 on the table that's being paid to the respective realtors, maybe 30000 each, right? Right. That's a lot of money. And I don't, wanna, I don't want to diminish the value of a good realtor, but it is very possible to get some of that money back to, to help the deal close. And it's very doable and it's very common. So be aware of that. And we'll talk on a, on a later episode about how to get that done for you. Well, I'm looking forward to that one. Nice. Um, number 11 would be underestimated the cost of home ownership. Again, we talked about this before. There's maintenance. There's yeah. other costs that go into owning a house, not just the monthly mortgage payment. 
Um, and you you may regret that. You get in there, you're like, oh my gosh, look at all the maintenance. Maybe this wasn't a good investment. Yeah. Um, also, underestimating the closing ta- cost and property taxes. And you know, you have um, in your co ops. Do you have monthly like mm-hmm. membership? I, I don't know what you would call them there. Yeah, right. Uh, ma- maintenance. Is that what you have? Okay, so you have maintenance. Um, some some we have homeowners associations out out in the burbs. Uh, if you don't bring that into your total number, they could be two hundred dollars a month mm-hmm. plus. Uh, so if you underestimate that, that's going to hurt when you move in. Definitely. So in condos, I mean, we've talked about this quite a bit. There's, um, there's a lot of things you need to keep in, keep in mind. You know, you need to amortize that (laughs) the roof will be repaired every 20, 10 or 20 years. I don't remember. Or that the refrigerator will, will conk out every whatever, seven years. So you got to think about these things that might come up. Here's another one. Uh, in condos or co-ops in, in apartment buildings, there is something called an assessment. Do you know what that is, Janice? I do not. All right. So let's say you buy an apartment or a condo, let's say, that um, where where the listed maintenance, the equivalent of your homeowner association's fees is 500 bucks a month, right? That's, the, okay. that's because you have a doorman, you have the guy who does the garbage, the super, and all the amenities in the building. That's just for the status quo. If anything comes up and it's a less than ideally run building, let's say, oh, wait, the water tower needs patching. They'll, they don't, you know, where does that money come from? That comes from the condo owners and they do a temporary, it's sort of like a, an additional maintenance charge um, of, let's say, another 50 bucks per month uh, for the next year. Interesting. Yeah. Those are called assessments. So you, what you want to do is you want to see maybe on, the, on a building the history of assessments. Are they well financed? Is there enough liquidity to cover these kinds of things or are they going to constantly be hitting up the owners for every, every little thing? So. Just keep an interesting. eye on Interesting. I didn't know that. So that could fluctuate based yep. on what's going on in the building. Very interesting. Sure. That could definitely change your uh, cost of homeownership a month if it goes up. For sure. Yeah. Um, and then 12, final, to buy or not to buy. Y- your, the regrets. It's simple. Never should have bought. <laughs> or maybe I should have bought. Yeah. You know, do we have to move again? Or, you know, what, one misconception is just throwing away money while yep. renting. I don't know about you, but when I was a little bit younger, that was yeah. the thinking. You rent, you're throwing it away. Mm-hmm. But I think that's changed, right? I mean, ownership, uh, home ownership does not fit everyone. Uh, there's so many situations now where renting is actually a better choice. Yep. Totally. Know, it depends on your situation. I mean, the assumption is uh, that if you're not renting, you're not saving. So uh, my understanding is that that, that – um, that logic is that if you're home, in, home if you're owning your home, it's sort of like forced <laughs> savings. The money you're putting right. into your house is also building up equity, so you kind of have this nest egg in your house. But if you have some discipline and you're renting for less than you would have paid if you're owning, which is the case in many large cities, renting is much cheaper than owning for the equivalent right. unit, um, and you're investing the difference, you may very well be better off. You just won't have a physical home, but you'll have more money <laughs> at the end right. of the 30 years. <laughs> But you really have to look at it. That's going back to that whole planning and, and, and mm-hmm. really sitting down to figure out what's best yep. for you, you know? Yeah. Cool. So there you go. Those are the 12 mistakes that you should try your best to avoid uh, if you want to avoid regretting home ownership. Uh, we talk about a lot of these points in my book, How to Buy Your Perfect First Home, available on Amazon. Anything else, Janice, or are we good here? No, that's definitely good information. De- and read the book. It yeah. d- gives you all the basics of uh, this stuff to help – arm you to go into this with a little more knowledge. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Janice. Talk to you next time. Talk soon. Bye now.